Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we're ready, Dean. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the Sword of the Spirit School of the Prophets. Glad you could join us. Glad to be here. Glad to see um, the bases here and excited about what God is going to do in our lives today. I'm glad that uh, God woke us up and put it on our hearts to come out. And I'm excited to hear Bonnie and Deanne teach and just um, let's just open our hearts in faith and trust and belief in God that he's going to exceed all that we can ask, think, or imagine. And so I want to open with the daily prayer covering and just um, if we can bow our hearts and our, our minds and just say, Dear Heavenly Father, we pray this prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind rebuke to no effect all division, discord, disunity, strife, anger, wrath, murder, criticism, condemnation, pride, envy, jealousy, gossip, slander, evil speaking, complaining, lying, false teaching, false gifts, false manifestations, lying signs and wonders, poverty, fear of lack, murmuring spirits, complaining spirits, hindering spirits, retaliatory spirits, deceiving spirits, religious spirits, occult spirits, witchcraft spirits, including Jezebel, Delilah, and Apollon. I bind all curses that have been spoken against us. We bless those who curse us and pray blessings on those who despitefully use us. We bind all spoken judgments made against us and judgments that we have made against others. We bind the power of negative words from others and we bind and render useless all prayers not inspired by the Holy Spirit, whether psychic, soul forced, witchcraft, or counterfeit tongues that have been prayed against us. We are God's children and we resist the devil. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. We put on the whole armor of God. We take authority over this day in the name of Jesus. Let it be prosperous for us. Let us walk in your love, Lord. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us today. We desert between the righteous and the wicked. We take authority over Satan and all his demons and those people who are influenced by them. We declare that Satan is under our feet and shall remain there forever. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are God's property. Satan, you are bound from our families, our minds, our bodies, our homes, and our finances. We confess that we are healed and whole. We flourish and we have a long and stable life, full of peace, patience, and love. We have authority over Satan and all the demons in Jesus' name. God, we pray for the ministry you have given us. Anoint us, God, for all you have called to do for us. We call forth divine appointments, open doors of opportunity, God-ordained encounters, and ministry positions. We claim a hedge of protection around us throughout this day and night. We ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, to dispatch your angels to surround us in our entire families, houses, cars, souls, and bodies. We ask your angels to protect our homes from any intrusion, protect us and our families from harmful, demonic, physical, and mental attacks. And we ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And so thank you again for joining us. And right now, I would like to... Um, introduce Ms. Dorothy Ray, who's going to open us up in prayer. Hello. Hello. Oh, um, I got this. Um, thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your beauty, for your holiness, for your love and your peace. Father, thank you for people that are on their way here, that they will not have any problems getting here. We thank you that they, that those that miss this teaching will miss a great part of all the work that Bonnie has done. So we just ask you to bless each one that comes, give them peace and joy and understanding and what the will of the Lord is. That as we learn about this end time, Zion and Jerusalem and all the things that are going to happen in our lives, it's just every day we realize how things are beginning to happen that we haven't been used to. But God, you said you will be with us always, even unto the end of the world. And so we thank you right now for that blood that's covering all of us, this place, so that there's no evil that will befall us and nothing will come near our, our homes or our bodies or anything like that. We just thank you for it in Jesus' name and give Bonnie the understanding and the words that's going to uh, be something maybe that you've never heard before, 
but you'll be able to absorb it through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon. It's good to be back in the house. We're uh, finishing up a series that's been running for one year. And today will be the, uh, we have one more lesson after this, and then we will have completed our course of one year of teaching. Uh, so we're excited to be here and share, and uh, we're glad that you're joining us live streaming, so we welcome you. And uh, today is going to be a fascinating subject on the New Jerusalem, so I believe that you will enjoy this. Uh, it certainly has opened my mind and my heart to the purposes of the Lord and what's coming for us. Very exciting. So before I do lead into the lesson, I'd like to just pray. Father, we just come into your presence, and we love you. We love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we ask you to rule and reign in this place today. And I submit myself to you, Lord, that the teaching of the Holy Spirit, the great teacher, the great one, will go forth today, and that you will plant your word in the hearts of those who have come, and the hearts of those who are prepared. Let it go into good soil, Lord, and increase our understanding, increase our knowledge of you, Lord. That's really what all this is about, that we might come into the knowledge and the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we just thank you for this time now. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I almost don't know where to begin. Uh, this is a huge subject. And uh, we've spent several uh, weeks talking about Mount Zion, that in the end time that the Lord will be, is establishing the house of the Lord, the mountain of the Lord, will be established. It talks about it in Isaiah 11, Isaiah 2. And um, now we're going to take a, we're going to just go a little further with um, the New Jerusalem. Now it seems that this city, it's a city of the Lord. It's created by God. It's a, it's called a heavenly city, and it comes down out of heaven. And it seems that, or most would agree, that it comes after the millennium, after this thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth. Uh, we know that um, Satan is released again for a very short time. There's another battle with Gog and Magog. It's a very short battle. It, it appears to be because it says fire comes down from heaven and consumes them. So it's, it appears to be very short. And then we have the uh, great white throne judgment. And then it talks about there's going to be a, a cleansing and a purging of the heavens and the earth. And um, it, it says that the Lord is going to make all things new. You know, it also talks about... Um, the earth being cleansed at the time of Noah. And it says in 2 Peter, it said the world at that time was destroyed by water. Well, we know that the earth remained in place. The whole earth was not destroyed. We still had the earth. It was just referring to the inhabitants on the earth. They were totally destroyed. And so there was a new um, group of people that came forth, the seed of Noah, that came forth on the earth. And I believe it's the same thing with the new heavens and the new earth, that we still will have the earth, and we still will have our heavens, but they're going to be cleansed and purged. And um, there's verses in Isaiah where it says um, that the earth will have all of its sinners exterminated from it. So there's a purifying that's going to take place. And um, we know that by that time, Satan and the beast and false prophet are committed into the lake of fire. We know that um, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. That will have happened. And death will be destroyed. And it says in, in the New Jerusalem, there will no longer be any sadness or sorrow or tears. 
that every everyone at that point will have this wonderful relationship with the Lord. And there will be a great time of uh, just peace, harmony, joy, and prosperity. So we, during the millennium, there's this uh, subduing of all enemies. There, there will be, the righteous will be blessed, and it will be an incredible time of peace for the righteous. But for the wicked, there's, it's going to be a horrible time. It will be called the day of the Lord. So there's these two things happening on the earth. Great conflict for the wicked and great blessing for the righteous. But that whole thousand year day is a day of subduing all the enemies that stand against God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So now today I'd like to look at the New Jerusalem. And if you would, open your Bibles to Revelation 21. And we're going to go through that. I just want to say a few things before we um, actually go to the scripture. You know, the New Jerusalem is a, it is from heaven. It's a city that is prepared by God. It's a heavenly city. So we don't know whether it will be natural realm. You know, the natural realm is our realm, which is tangible, touchable. Our five senses can discern it or whether it will be more of a spiritual realm, this new Jerusalem. So be noticing that as I talk. Um, we know that um, Abraham, he saw this city. Abraham, all the way back 2,000 years um, from the time of Adam, was Abraham, and he had a vision of this heavenly city. And he went out trying to find it. It talks about it in Hebrews 11. It says, by faith. Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. So he thought that inheritance was something that was going to happen in his lifetime. And in a sense it did, because he inherited land. And he went out not knowing where he was going, for he was looking for the city which has, has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So he had had a glimpse of the city. And Jesus said um, to his disciples, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. So some believe that this Jer New Jerusalem, and I've made a little picture. <laughs> it's so inadequate, but when we get through going through the scriptures, I believe your imagination is just going to blow this up, and you will really come away with a, a, a new understanding of the New Jerusalem. Uh, for myself, it certainly did that. It seems like the more that we study and meditate, it becomes so real. It's become so real to me from just you know taking time and looking into the Word. And the Holy Spirit, of course, unites with our spirit and, and solidifies it. So this, um, I, I just want to say a few things that I personally um, maybe believe is too strong of a word, but I feel persuaded. It may not be correct, so I want to just clarify that as I'm talking. But I do, I see evidence in Scripture. And, and what it is, is I believe that this Mount Zion, that is a spiritual mountain, it goes from the natural realm over Jerusalem, the natural city of Jerusalem, and then it expands upward, like a, it's a vertical tabernacle with an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. It's so it goes into the mid-heaven realm. You know, we know there's this mid-heaven realm that's right around us. Ephesians tells us it's the realm where the spiritual darkness and wickedness is. It's the realm of where Babylon is. It's, in a, it's a spiritual realm that's going to be cleansed. So it goes from outer court to a holy place, like the tabernacle, and then to the holy of holies. So I personally believe this city is the capstone that whoops, will 
that will eventually, later, because Mount Zion is forever. And the Lord says, I've made it my dwelling place forever. So Mount Zion continues forever. But on the top of Mount Zion, I believe this heavenly Jerusalem will come down out of heaven and position itself on the top of Mount Zion. And it's a bridal chamber. It's the bridal chamber. We've been talking about the bride. It's the place Jesus has prepared for us, for those that will dwell with him. It's a bridal chamber. It's so beautiful. So we're looking for that. We wait for that. Um, it's a, it's a, um, it says in Zechariah, this is one of the reasons that I, I tend to believe that it's going to be a, um, that it's going to come down in the heavens. So it will be a heavenly city. And as we go through the verses, you'll see that it lights the earth. It's actually a lamp. It looks like a lampshade. Because the walls are solid gold, and it's transparent gold. And it says the lamb is its lamp. So if you can imagine a light bulb with a filament, you know, if you have a light bulb and turn it on, you hardly can look at that filament. It's so bright to your eyes. That's the lamb. And then the light that goes out from the light bulb or from the lamb will just go right through these transparent gold walls and down through the, the foundation stones are all gemstones. It's so spectacular and beautiful. And it goes down and it lights the earth. Many times after I study, I'll go back and just look at other people's commentaries. I, I don't use commentaries to study. I use the word. But then after I, I feel it's solidified, I might look. And almost every commentary said that although some people believe the uh, New Jerusalem comes down and actually sits on the earth, most say that they seem to feel that somehow it's positioned over the earth. And I think, yes, it is, because it's positioned on the top of Mount Zion. And it completes Zion. And it goes on for eternity. So that's one thing that, that was just an opinion of mine. <clears throat> in Zechariah, in 4 7, it says, He will bring forth the top stone, or the capstone, with shouts, grace to it, grace to it. And when I read that, it's talking about uh, Zerubbabel, who was a governor, and finishing a work. And he says, don't despise small beginnings. And I believe that he was this work that was it started with very small beginnings that actually started, Zion started all the way back to the time of Melchizedek, the small beginnings. But um, the capstone that is coming down out of heaven is the new Jerusalem. And then um, the Lord... The Holy Spirit said this to me because I was asking him about it. I said, the Holy Spirit, is that right? You know, does the New Jerusalem land on top of Mount Zion? And he said, it's a city on a hill. <laughs> oh, a city on a hill. You know, this is the hill of the Lord. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And then also in... Um, Psalm 15 and Psalm 24 talks about the hill of the Lord. And so Mount Zion is often referred to as the Lord's hill. So um, it's a city set on a hill. And we know that what that means, you know, that this bright light is going to come out and you can't hide a city set on a hill. So I believe this new Jerusalem will eventually be positioned on top of Mount Zion. Um, and then... Um, the, Mount, uh, the New Jerusalem is called the Bride in Revelation 21.9. It's called the Bride. And we know that the Lord is not interested so much in architecture. We know it's not <clears throat> that it's the city itself is the Bride. Jesus is going to have a people that's his Bride. But the people inhabit the New Jerusalem. And then it's also called the Lamb's Wife the city, the lamb's wife. 
and it's called the Holy City in Revelation 21 2. And it's called the Holy Jerusalem. And then it's called my Father's house. You know, there's another reference <clears throat> to, it's in Galatians 4 6. And this one I, I've been thinking on. It says, But the Jerusalem above is free, she is our mother. And he's talking about, in that scripture, and I'm not going to go to teach on it right now, but he's talking about Hagar and Mount Sinai mm -hmm. being um, enslaved. Mm -hmm. But the new Jerusalem is free. So, so, and then when it says, is our mother, the new <laughs> Jerusalem is our mother. Anyway, I had a lot of thoughts about that, that... Um, you know, because we were created before the foundation of the world and seen, birthed by the Spirit. And this being a spiritual house. So, I just, anyway, well, I have to think on these things, but it does say um, the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. So let's go, I'm going to start now and just kind of go through the verses. Let's um, turn to Revelation 21, and we're going to focus on 1 to 27. And I'm reading from New American Standard, but there are other, all the translations, and I did look at it in the other translations as well. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Now, 2 Peter 3.13 tells us, according to his promises, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So this new heaven and earth have been purified and cleansed, but note that the earth remains, that the earth remains forever. The new heavens that are remade refer to the natural heavens. These are natural sky that we see, that heaven, and the mid-heaven that has been polluted. That's what's going to be remade. The third heaven remains in place. That's not polluted, where God is. <clears throat> so all, when I see all things are like evolving upward. I hesitate to use the word evolve, but I don't mean it as far as evolution. But it, it says that there's no more sea. See, the lower realms become, they, they fall off, or they, they're not, they don't affect. Everything is moving upward to higher realms of the Lord, spiritual realms, everything is moving up. So I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. So keep in mind, this is bridal. This is the bridal city. It's the city of the bride. It's a bridal chamber. It's spotless. It's beautiful, pure, magnificent, splendid perfection beyond our imagination. Revelation 21.9 called the bride the Lamb's wife. It's prepared by God. He says, and I read this, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I'd go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. The Lord has always had in his heart to um, have a dwelling and dwell with his people. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. So it will be a corporate people in the presence of God. Um, Ephesians 2, 19-22 says, Then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles. And we're going to see that the New Jerusalem, the foundation stones, are engraved with the apostles' names. 
and Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building is being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Revelation 3.12 says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. So during the millennium, there are people that are being marked for the new Jerusalem. I believe that the name of the 144,000 is actually a mark that's on us and it marks us for New Jerusalem. We'll see in the measurements of the city that uh, the, the number that keeps coming up is the 144,000 by 144,000. It's 12,000 12, stadia by 12,000 stadia, 144. All the measurements come up 144. Um, in verse 5, he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. God's word is trustworthy. We can trust it. We know that what, if he said it, it's going to happen. Amen. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. He's the A and the Z. The beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. You know, many people are thirsty, or many people are thirsty, and many people are not thirsty mm -hmm. for the water of the Lord. Amen. You know, many don't even think about it or have a desire. But the Lord has put in his people, and we've talked about this like a little homing device that draws us to Zion. Blessed is the man in whose heart is the highway to Zion. We're also being drawn to our true home, our eternal home, which will be right here in the New Jerusalem. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Several years ago, I had a woman tell me that um, there is no bride of Christ, and that if we would carefully read Revelation, that it says the bride is a city. But we know, and I said this a few minutes ago, that the, the bride are people, mm -hmm. and the Lord is concerned about his people. Mm -hmm. And all of the word talks about how he desires to dwell with his people. He's been wooing his bride through the years to have a, a bride that for his Lord, for Jesus Christ. So um, the, it, this really is just the bridal chamber is what it is, with full of his bride men and women that love him. And he carried me away in spirit to a great high mountain. I wonder if that's Mount Zion. And showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And we know that um, John was transported in the spirit, that God had picked him up in the spirit and taken him and put him in a position where he could see this event. And um, it's, it was a heavenly city that he was seeing. Having the glory of God, her brilliance, her light, was like a very costly stone, a stone of clear jasper, or like a crystal clear diamond, is really the description of the jasper. So brilliant, so much light. And the glory of God was in this um, structure and it says that the Lord not only his glory was in it but also the glory and honor of kings it says in verse 24 
or 21, 24, and the glory and honor of nations. So the glory of the Lord's presence, the glory of kings, and the glory of nations. Verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There are angels at each gate, so huge angels standing by the gates. The great high wall speaks of a fortress and a stronghold. We were talking earlier, you know, why does the New Jerusalem need to have a wall? Because at that point, it seems that all evil is done away with. But yet it has this magnificent wall. And the wall is pure diamond. You know, I tried to make a little, but I couldn't think of it. If I made something clear, it wouldn't work. So I made it gold. But um, this huge city with this wall all the way around it, and we're going to see that, that there are gates, three gates on each side, and um, then the, all gemstones, crystal clear gold, the walls of the city. Let's keep going. The New Jerusalem is full of dazzling, pure, and brilliant light. And these stones are going to reflect all different colored lights when the light comes out of the New Jerusalem. The great high wall speaks of a fortress and a stronghold. Psalm 125, 1-2 says, Those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but it abides forever. Amen. Psalm 27, 5, For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle, in the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. See, all of these are referring to the mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion. And being lifted up on a rock will be the city of Mount Zion, or the heavenly Jerusalem. Isaiah 4, 4 through 6. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory will be a canopy, and there will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and the refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. Well, this verse is talking about Zion and how it's going to be a fortress and a protection during the whole millennial reign. But later, this city will come and be the final or the fulfillment of this stronghold. There are 12 gates. The city of the New Jerusalem has 12 gates. A person cannot just enter the city from any direction or any place. They must enter through a gate. And the names written are inscribed on the gates. There are names that are, are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. The names, however, are not listed in this verse. The names of the gates appear to be the names of the tribes. If they correspond with millennial Jerusalem in Ezekiel 48:31, they may be as followed. And notice, um, did we read the scripture where it talks about the gates? Uh, it's the next scripture. I think I'll go there. It, it's scripture. It's um, 13. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now, notice the order, too. He first says the gates on the east. We know that the east gate is always the most important gate. We see it in um, the tabernacle was facing east. The light uh, of the sun comes up in the morning from the east, and it floods into the door of the tabernacle. Um, we see this in Ezekiel's temple, where the the gate was facing, facing east. And I believe that um, that 
is you know the scripture where it says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and let the King of glory come in. <coughs> Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He is the King of glory. Amen. I believe those verses are probably some of the oldest verses in the Bible. And I believe that it's speaking of the heavenly state, even before the foundation of the world, where, and the pattern is, our, our solar system is patterned after it, with the sun going around the earth, bringing the glory every morning. It comes from the east, and the glory goes over the whole earth. And I believe that this scripture is talking about something very ancient that has taken place, where the glory of the Lord comes in and it enters through the east gate. So the position is the east gate and the three gates on the north. So it goes east, north, south, and west. In verse 14, And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So these foundation stones, you know, I kind of want to skip I guess we're almost there. I want to talk about the size of the New Jerusalem. But these, these foundation stones, we don't know whether they're like a solid stone that would be hundreds of feet long, hundreds of feet high, solid emerald, solid ruby, I mean huge. Or they could also be layered with ruby, emerald, sapphire. We don't know. But the description gives us all the different stones as, and that we know that, again, you know, the scripture about that our faith that we're, that we're, is built on the apostles. You know, the teaching of the apostles is, a, is the foundation of our faith. And so these stones are the foundation of the wall of the New Jerusalem. And of course, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We know that. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. Its length and its width and its height are equal. Now, many people, and I tend to feel this way, that the New Jerusalem may be a pyramid shape. A four, it's because it says the city is laid out like a square. And it tells us that the length and the width are the same, and the height is the same. So it could be like this, which would make it a true capstone. Most people draw it like this, a square like a perfect cube, which it could be that too. I'll tell you there's two. I was, I was sort of convinced that it was the pyramid because in the Bible code, they have found in the text a pyramid. Wow. And on one side of the pyramid, like if you lay out all the Jewish texts flat for the Torah, right? You know, that, I believe Hebrew was up and down, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So if you lay it all out, first five books of the Bible, in a big, flat square, they can find a pyramid, and along one side, all the uh, coding in it has to do with hell. So right along, there's like this dividing line, all this coding has to do with is hell, and the coding within the pyramid has to do with the New Jerusalem. Some also believe that the pyramids in Gaza were originally built by Enoch as an altar, but then later taken over and used you know, for pagan worship. But we, but we don't know. The, the reason it could be a cube is because it could represent the Holy of Holies, which in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies was a perfect 10 by 10 by 10 cube. And in uh, 1 Kings, it says that when the temple was built, 
and i believe that cube was um twenty cubits by twenty cubits, so it was larger than the one in the moses tabernacle but it said solomon overlaid it all in gold right. it was all in gold mm -hmm. so that would be very strong evidence for it looking like the cube the perfect square so we don't know we don't know um, i will say that um, two people that i know that have seen the new jerusalem uh, said that it was a pyramid but i don't know <laughs> i don't know so whatever it is it's magnificent and beautiful now in the king james it says um, 12,000 furlongs. Mm -hmm. and, and in the um, New King James, it says uh, 12,000 furlongs. In the New American Standard, it says miles. But near as the people can tell, it's either 1,400 miles or 1,500 miles, so we might be off 100 miles. But just to give you an idea, 1,500 miles long and wide and high means it would extend into outer space. An average jet plane flies at six and a half miles from the ground. Six and a half miles. A regular jet. So we're talking 1,500 miles high. Wow. It's huge. I was overwhelmed when I realized the size of it. <laughs> it would cover, if it landed on the Earth, it would cover most of the United States. Wow. It would reach from Canada to Mexico. And then it would sit in just a little bit from our eastern border and maybe the edge of right as you go into California. That's a city. If you were to put storage, you know, like an office building, an average office building, the ceiling height might be 12 feet high. It would have 600,000 stories high. Wow. That's how high. Wow. I mean, literally, it goes to outer space. <clears throat> My son said, Outer space begins 12 and a half miles from ground level. That's where we would say outer space, 12 and a half miles. So this is 1,500 miles. It's huge. It is so huge. It's, it's unfathomable. And then it's solid gold, the walls. But it says they're pure, transparent gold. Now, not to kill my punchline, but earlier I said it's a lamp. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to see that the lamp is the light. And I, I use the example because some of you just came in, but like a light bulb, a 100 watt light bulb, if you plug it in and try to look into the light bulb, the filament is so bright that you can't look at it. And that's what the lamb is. He's like the filament of a light bulb. The light is so bright. Can you imagine? Beautiful, beautiful, pure gold. And the streets are all pure gold. And the wall, it says it's made out of jasper, which is diamond. Can you visualize it? This Gold structure with an outer wall, diamond, with all the gemstones at the bottom of the diamond wall. And the wall would come down, and then the, the footings of the wall of diamond would be gemstones, pure stones, ruby, sapphire, diamond, well, I've uh, listed the stones. Hmm. So beautiful. I mean, talk about a light show. It will hang in the, in the sky and light the earth. He measured its wall. And, and this is, um, it's a little bit nebulous. We don't have a, a clear definition on this verse. 
He measured its wall, 72 yards, or 144 cubics, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. And the, so he doesn't specify whether the wall is 144 cubics thick or high. So we don't have a real clear um, definition there. The material of the wall was jasper, we're in verse 18. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Imagine the wall of clear diamonds surrounding the city of pure transparent gold. Verse 19, the foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third, I'm not sure how to say these, Sheldonite, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth crystophaz, the eleventh I don't know how to say that, Jacob, Jason, and the 12th amethyst. And I've included a list of, of the colors, you know, that they are. They're, some are, are sort of clear, others are, are more uh, like gray, blue, and yellow. Some of them have stripes in them. Some of them are pure colors, red and green and blue. Others are are paler colors, amber, green, but just beautiful stones. Each one, there's a turquoise or a violet. So the stones cannot be absolutely identified, but they are priceless and of the purest quality that's known to man. They are an expression of the glorious radiant city. One can only imagine the beauty as the light passes through the golden city and the diamond wall then reflecting through the foundation of stones, it would produce a beautiful spectrum of color and light, which would be almost unimaginable. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Uh, no doubt the pearls were huge. And uh, I was talking earlier with a friend of mine that had um, been taken and saw the New Jerusalem. And I was at a dinner, and it was when I first met him, and he was telling me about what he saw. And he said the, the pearls um, operated on a mechanism, and he had a name for it. But I believe it was like a spiral mechanism where the pearl would sort of come down and, you know, a way to close the gate and open the gate. But then, um, so I was texting him about it. He said, oh, no, I think, I think they were free-flowing. So I said, well, if they're free-flowing, I mean, they can't just roll. They would have to be on a track or something, you know, to, for it to swing open, and then they could roll on a track. I mean, can you imagine? We're probably talking a pearl that's 100 feet high or more, you know, as the gate. But it does say the gates um, are never closed. So maybe they were open in a stationary form or something. I don't know. But huge and single pearls, just so beautiful. Um, I saw a note in verse 22. I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. So the Lord will dwell with his people, and there will be unhindered fellowship, communion, intimacy with the Almighty. Can you imagine? Never has mankind had this kind of a relationship with God. John 17, 24, Jesus said, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundations of the world. Jesus asking that we will be with him. There is a throne. There's no temple. That's interesting. In verse 22, I saw no temple. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Verse 23. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp 
is the Lamb. So it doesn't say that there isn't a sun or a moon. It just said it doesn't have need of a sun or a moon. And then um, I believe that earlier, too, some of you were here, and I said that I believe that this new Jerusalem is the capstone of Zion and that it is a city set on a hill and that the light will come from this city and shine down onto the earth. In 1 John, it says, 1 John 1, 5, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Hebrews 12, 2 to 3, he is the brightness of his glory. Revelation 22, 5, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Verse 24, the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So this scripture shows us that it gives light to the earth. So during the time of the New Jerusalem, this is just my, my persuasion, what I, I think. I believe that the earth will be in place, that there will be nations, uh, godly nations, sheep nations, nations that love the Lord. And then there will be other peoples that will be ruling and reigning. But there will be a higher level, which will be the throne room, which will be the bridal chamber. I mean, it's such a high call that we have as, as the bride. And I think I've said it before, you know, the bride, she just loves him. She is just in love with Jesus. She lays her life down for him. She separates from the world. The world doesn't have anything that attracts itself for her. She's lost that attraction for the world. She has a heavenly mindset. I mean, when we really start seeing this, it's really something to change our mindset when he says that we're to think on heavenly things, right? Think on things above. This is above. Yeah. This is our calling. This is where the Lord would have us be with him. And it's for all of eternity. Our life is so short here on earth. It's just mm. so short. It is. And we don't have to walk in this natural realm. You know, we can walk in the realm of the spirit and separate ourselves from the natural. We don't have to be a part of it. And so this calling of the Lord for his bride, he's put it in our hearts to press in. You know, just be in love with him. And those that love him, he will have with him for all of eternity. And that is on and on and on. The nations will walk by its light. So for me, that tells, that's why I believe that it's positioned like in the sky. It hangs in the sky. It's, an, it's a new sun. It's a new form of light. You know, we had, before the sun was created, it said the glory, the, let there be light. There was glory over the whole earth. There was glory light, a different form of light. And then four days later, the sun was made. Well, I think this is reverting back to this will be a glory light that will come from his glory and light the earth. And the kings will walk by its light. The nations and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In, the, in verse 25, in the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Now this is just interesting because it gives us a little clue that there's still time. There still is time. We're going to see it again. It's in the daytime. Its gates will never be closed. Mm -hmm. Verse 27. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. Revelation 22. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, 
clear as a crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. This water of life is so interesting. We see the water of life um, in um, the book of Ezekiel. Uh, I think water of life refers to um, the ruler and creator as the source of all light. Um, Ezekiel saw water flowing from the south side of the altar from the temple. That's Ezekiel 47, 1. And every living creature where the river goes will live. All kinds of, this is still Ezekiel, all kinds of trees, their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. Their fruit will be good for food and their leaves for healing. So compare this scripture to, um, in verse 2, in the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Mm -hmm. So it seems like they were seeing the same thing. Um, and also there's time, again. that there, It talks about month, that the trees were yielding their fruit every month. So it, it appears that there's still time, or that God's watching time. The tree of life, we see it in the Garden of Eden, at the very beginning of the Bible, mm -hmm. and then we see it in Revelation in the New Jerusalem, at the end of the Bible, the tree of life. And in Genesis 3, 22 and 24, it says, if you eat of it, you'll live forever. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 11:30 says, the fruit of righteousness is the tree of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 15, 4 says, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Mm -hmm. Revelation 2 7. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. And in Revelation 22 14, those who do his commandments will have a right to the tree of life. Verse 3. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his bond servants will serve him. The curse is done away, it's finished. Sin has been paid for, death is finished. The last enemy owes death and it's finished. And then we, the bond servants, which we had a message, a lesson on the bond servants, they are in the presence of the Lord and they serve him. Verse four says, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet as yet appeared what we will be. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him just as he is. And verse 5, There will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of a light or a lamp or a light or the light of the sun of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them. Now King James reads a little differently, but the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. You know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, we see Jesus being illumined. And Moses, in the presence of God, his face was illumined. Right. So when we live in the presence, that close, in this bridal chamber, we will be illumined. And we cheer. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. We are the light. The New Jerusalem will be the city set on a hill, the hill of Mount Zion, and it will give light to the new earth, and it will be glorious. Hallelujah. Lord, I just thank you for um, the word. It's so precious to us, Lord. I pray that our imaginations will just see the new Jerusalem, Lord, with its glory and its splendor. Lord, we, we look for it. It's going to be a fabulous light show to all the earth. 
sparkling and pure and brilliant and radiant. And Lord, we pray that um, this call that you put in us by your Holy Spirit will continue to woo us as your bride. And that we'll agree with it, Lord. That we'll come into agreement that we will have the mind of Christ. That we'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind to have the mind of Christ. And Lord, I thank you that um, these things of the earth are very dim. And yet this new, beautiful, um, new Jerusalem is so bright and beautiful, Lord. Let us lay down the things that are insignificant, Lord, and seek after you and your kingdom and this great high call. And most of all, Lord, we just want to be with you. We want to be in your presence. We want to be with you, Lord Jesus, more than anything. And so we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it can um, quicken us to know the things that you have for us and such a beautiful future that you planned. And so we love you, Daddy God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, yes. Um, We're going to do the offering. Anyone have anything to give? Anyone have anything to give? Father, thank you for those who gave. Thank you for this coming together, God, to expound on your word and get a more clear vision of your word, God. God, I pray that you bless this offering. I pray that you bless the people that gave an offering. I pray that you bless the people who didn't even give an offering, who's just here to hear your word because they love you, God. And God, I pray that you just watch over your people and keep them, Lord. God, I pray that you just be a be a father to the to these to your children, Lord, and just be what you are to them, God. Be everything that you are, God, and that you are I am to us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, we're just gonna take a five minute break and then come back and Dan's gonna be teaching. Okay? Just take a break.
important people. Huh? Amen. <laughs>
back in, in line so we can continue and, 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 and enjoy the first day of November. Amen. Amen. As we come into fall and, and appreciate Lord the Lord for the season, the change in the season. I want to say something prophetically. Uh, before we, we get started. There's a restructuring going on. Mm -hmm. And whatever God is doing in the spiritual realm and restructuring everything at a, at, a, at a global level, at a national and a local level, I want you, want you to be aware that not only is God doing it at such a mass scale, but it parallels directly to your life. Mm -hmm. He's also going to restructure you. Amen. And restructure this season in your life. Now the restructuring sometimes is not always good. But it's necessary in the eyes of God. Amen. Okay. There's a shift and a change coming if it isn't already in your life. And this season God is going to very strategically hit the final details in your life. Mm. And restructure every area of your life. Change is good. Sometimes people don't like change, but it's necessary. Amen. In the eyes of God, it is necessary. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be able to once again stand here on holy ground in your presence. I repent and confess of my sins before you and ask you that you would cleanse me in accordance to your word. Make, Father God, clean everything up. Make me pure and white and in snow. Let self die and that you, Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth that will lead and guide us into all truth. Teach in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And why I say that I wasn't trying to say that that's the Holy Spirit is because when we, we're looking at, we're studying the book of Hebrews 11, and we're going to close out with that next uh, class teaching into the early part of chapter 12. But if you notice within chapter 11, Everyone that God called, everyone that is used an example and is named in chapter 11, every one of them, there was always a season around them and their life changing constantly and consistently. Mm -hmm. And not only the seasons of their life were changing and were shifting, but it was always mobile. Mm -hmm. They were always on the go. Yeah. Always on the move. Mm -hmm. Enoch walked upright with God. He walked so upright and so good with God, God can stand it and snatch them up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We look at Abel. We look at Abraham. We looked at Sarah. And when Bonnie, you were talking about the new Jerusalem. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we can go there. <clears throat> verse, verse 8. 
Abel's chapter number verse eight. Just very briefly, I just set the foundation before we continue. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Amen. I've been teaching the last class we had. I've been teaching about their anticipation through the, the children of Israel. The prophetic word that was echoed over and over again through Almighty God was the promise of the Messiah. And they hoped and prayed, and a lot of them really, you know, for lack of a better term, I don't want to use this word, but wished that they could live long enough to see this promise That's being right. manifested. Yeah. And even if they didn't get to see Christ himself face to face, they <laughs> Which one is it? Oh, number two. Number two. They knew even after this life, there was a promise. Mm -hmm. They will get to see their Savior. Mm -hmm. They will get to see their deliverer. Amen? Mm -hmm. I say that to piggyback off of what she was talking about with the new Jerusalem, the promise that God has continuously and continues to speak and teach to us. I want to go back and recap for those who weren't here last class, and I'm going to start with uh, verse 23 today and go down to verse 29, but just to recap with, with verse 21, amen? By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. And by faith, verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. The, the righteous living rule be number 20 from verse 21 given was that righteous living releases the blessings from one generation to the next. It's the previous generation being passed on to the current and present generation being passed on to the next, which means my seed and their seed and their seed, seed, etc. The descendants in and through my bloodline is blessed. We are here as a result of somebody's great great grandparent or ancestor that was in right standing with God. Amen. Amen. Somebody said yes. Amen. Somebody sowed the seed. Who knows, maybe prior to the 15, 16, maybe someone in our bloodline for every generation continue to walk righteously before God, and as a result, you and I are here today. Amen. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, four generations, mm -hmm. because of one man's obedience to leave his land. Righteous living is based on faith and very, more importantly, obedience to God. Amen. Even when it doesn't make sense. That's right. We still say yes and we still go and do. Mm -hmm. Abraham didn't know where he was going. But he left everything and obeyed God. And as a result, Isaac, as a result, Jacob, yes, we are flawed individuals. No one is perfect. Right. But through our flaws, it is our obedience to God. And from Jacob comes Joseph. Amen? Righteous living always sees and speaks into the prophetic. The future for the descendants always involves change, mobility, and a piece of the past to remind and accompany them of where they came from and God's promise to them. They left Egypt and, and Joseph made them promise 
promise him when I die and you live, take my bones with you. Yeah. I used this example the last time. None of us knew today that somebody in our bloodline planted a seed mm -hmm. from wherever it is that we are geographically came from and the journey that it took physically where you are today. Yes. My ancestry comes from Scotland and they came across the seas here to the Americas. And from the Americas someone left and was crazy enough to travel to Fiji to the land of cannibalism, ancestor worship, and God knows you can name every kind of decadence and darkness, they did it. To come around full circle, and the ancestry through my father's side and my mother's side are the little island nation of Thomas. I'm a living testimony of that line that has pretty much gone halfway around the world and will continue. Amen. That's right. Your ancestors from Africa, from Europe, look at the journey. Mm -hmm. Only God can do that. Amen. Amen. Because of somebody said yes to God. Yeah. Somebody prayed, Mama Dorothy. Somebody received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Barney's teaching today. Dorothy is a pastor. You are a prophet. You have the gift of healing. Look at the journey. Look at the, 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 the DNA and how it traveled. Because somebody not only said yes, but they lived righteously Amen. before God. And as a result, their seed is showing the benefits. How you live your life today affects your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren tomorrow. Even those who practice in the dark side, the same principle applies. Mm -hmm. We have witch doctors how many generations back That's who right. are practicing the arts today and they have continuously passed on. Mm -hmm. And you see the curses that come along that bloodline. Yep. That's true. And we are a result of the blessings that have come down our bloodline. But don't let it stop with you and I. That's right. We continue to push past everything we see and continue to say yes to God, continue to stand on our faith, and continue to sow the seed because your grandson is the one that's going to reap the harvest. Mm -hmm. Your great-grandchildren, your children. Amen? Verse 23, we'll start. By faith, Moses, hear me enter with, with the, the Hebrews has taken us through this journey. And now, uh, the children of Israel, we can, we can kind of follow through with this travel pattern. And so, from Joseph, here we go to Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. The Maimonites called Moses the most perfect human being. And the sages of the Talmud said that the divine presence spoke from his throat. And the Torah attests that the man who took the children of Israel out of Egypt and received the Torah from God was the most humble man on the face of the earth. That's right. He was born in Egypt on the 7th of Adar of the year 200 and, excuse me, 2368 from creation at a time when Israel and they became they were slaves to the rulers of the land. Now if just in case you guys didn't know, he's the third born. Mm -hmm. Not the first born. Yeah. I think some of us we, we forget that maybe he was because when we study his life journey, Aaron, and his Mary. brother Aaron and Miriam, okay. they they submitted to his leadership. Yeah. But he yeah. wasn't the oldest. No. He was the he was the he yeah. was the baby. Yeah. Okay? And uh, just so, let's just, uh, just throw it out there, FYI. Aaron, uh, excuse me, Miriam was the oldest, then Aaron, then, uh, then Moses. 
So at three months, just a brief background, three months is three months old as being a baby. That's when he was discovered by uh, Pharaoh's daughter. She retrieved him out of, um, out of the water. It's interesting, she was the one, she gave that name. She named him Moses, and it just stuck with him. And God didn't refute that. You, you guys notice that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Named by an Egyptian pagan woman. And God didn't come behind it and say, no, you're not going to. It's just interesting. I thought I'd just throw that out. I was like, yeah, that's true. Because you think God would say something other than, no, you're not going to name him that. Um, and when he was 20 years old, he left. He fled Egypt. And it wasn't when he turned 80 that God called him. Imagine that, 80 years old, and God <laughs> called you to go and deliver people. 80. Uh -huh. Okay? Nothing is impossible with God. We clearly get we get to see uh, you you get to see a part of God that you probably would never have tapped into before. As we know, one year is life, one day is life, a thousand. A thousand. And a thousand years is life, a day. So God doesn't see eighty. Maybe when God looked at Moses when he was eighty in the physical, he probably was eight in the spiritual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, but it's amazing. God can do anything. God can call anyone. Doesn't matter. But he said yes. Amen. Okay. Number twenty-four. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Righteous living. Ruby, as you mature, you want to write this down, I'll read it real slow. As you mature and come to the saving knowledge of Christ, you must detach and disassociate yourself from old Form a connection. Yeah. Amen. Okay? Amen. As you mature and come to the saving knowledge of Christ, you must detach, disassociate yourself from the old form of connection. Sometimes this means your family, friends, old habits, behaviors that has kept you in comfort and bondage. Should I repeat that again? Sometimes it includes family, friends, old habits, behaviors that have kept you in comfort and bondage. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 24. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay? And then Mark chapter 2, verse 22. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine burst the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Moses came to a realization that he didn't want to have anything to do with the royal household of Egypt. He didn't want to have anything to do with that life. And be identified to that. 
when we decide and when we, we, we fully take on this righteous living, and that's another thing. It's one thing to say that I'm living right. And then we quote scripture and say, it is through Christ that we are made right before him. But I'm challenging you. Prove it. Amen. Thank you. Don't prove it to you or the person sitting next to you. Prove it to God. Amen. Because I can say I'm living right. But then God looks at my heart and says, who are you for it? Mm. Mm. Amen. Verse 24. Verse 25, I'm sorry. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Righteous living ruling. Righteous living is selfless. Your focus is on the other. Your focus is on another. Righteous living is selfless. Your focus is on the other. Your focus is on another. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. For if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. He chose to give up that life of royalty, pomp, circumstance, being comfortable, I can get anything I want. I can be wherever I want. Everything served to me at my fingertips. And turn away from all that, the life that is easy, to follow his heart and identify with the affliction of his bloodline, his people. You are the link. You are the prayer. You are strength healing. For someone else. It's not about you. When you live righteous before God, it is you being selfless to yourself. It's not about you. It's about praying for somebody else. Amen. It's about seeking where they're at. It's about being their strength through encouragement through the word of God. It's about praying healing. It's about praying deliverance. Versus choosing to engage and embrace in sinful activity. Mm -hmm. Amen? Okay. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here I am. Send me. Moses didn't have to walk away from the life of a prince. He got it made. He had it made. But verse 25 said, he chose to suffer the afflictions with the people than to enjoy in the passing pleasure. Passing pleasure. We, you have a decision. You don't have to live right before God. Hmm. You can live right where you are and be comfortable. In your sin, in the spirit of religion, and whatever it is that you think in the own comfort and solace of your own personal space, that defines who you are. It's a personal decision. Great men and women of God who wanted to do great things for the kingdom are never ever selfish. Amen. Amen. They are always selfless. Amen. They put their own comforts to the side to meet the need of another. Yeah. Amen. He brought himself down 
from the throne of Pharaoh's high court, his house, to give all that up, to walk in the footsteps of his people. It was his choice. Yes, God's hand was on his life, preordained since the foundations of the earth. But Moses identified, he saw how they were being treated. And he connected with them. He said, no, I give up all this to make sure that whatever it is they need, I'll do my part to help them. When you decide and when you live right before God, always remember, it is not about you. Find time to connect with someone else. Be it a phone call, be it a hug, be it can we go and have lunch, be it a cup of coffee, be it give, call them and say, how are you doing? You cross my spirit. Do you need prayer? We get so comfortable within ourselves mm. and we forget that somebody is suffering. If they suffer, the word of God, I just read it, suffer with them. Amen. If they are being honored, honor them. Amen? Amen. Verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. We're still talking about Moses. Mm -hmm. Righteous living. Next, righteous living movie. When you live righteously before God, you will always encounter suffering for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. There is a great reward in your suffering. The reward is greater than the temporary, fleeting, <coughs> seductive treasures and pleasures of this world. Amen? Can I, you want me to read that again? Yes. Okay. Righteous living. When you live righteously before God, you will always encounter suffering for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. There is a great reward than the temporary, fleeting, seductive pleasures and treasures of this world. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 23 to 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as, the, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Revelations chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Amen. 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 Verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Okay, verse 27, right? By faith he forsook Egypt, I'm reading from the New King James, mm -hmm. not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Righteous living ruby for verse 27. You forsake the world. You must forsake the world without fear or mockery. Retaliation, intimidation, and even physical death. Endurance through your righteous living lifestyle. Through this, keep your eyes of faith 
on Jesus. There's more to us living righteously than by than just doing right. Mm -hmm. You have to be aware that in doing right, you are going to get attacked. Mm -hmm. And that attack would come where people will mock you, ridicule you, they will try to intimidate you, they will retaliate against you when you take a stand for righteousness for the Lord and his name's sake. Amen. Even to the point of death. Yeah. Are you willing? Are you willing to pay the price? Will you be able to endure through all of that? Through all of the mockery, through all of the ridicule, through all of the threats and intimidation, even with the threat of death on your life, will you continue to keep your eyes on Jesus? James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, we'll just go back on Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 36. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Amen? Amen. Mark chapter 13, verse 13. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. This is Jesus talking. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. This is an endurance race. Yep. Even in our walk with God. Amen? Amen. Okay, I'm almost done. Verse 20. Let's see. Verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Righteous living, Ruby. Righteous living honors and obeys and partakes in the ordinances. I.e. communion. Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter fifteen. Verse three and four. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 and 4, this is the Gospel. If anybody ever asked you, if this is uh, I.E. for evangelism. What is the Gospel? This is the Gospel. This is the verse. You never remember anything else. Remember this. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. What is the gospel? This is it. That he died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Righteous living. We honor and obey and partake in the ordinances. Also reminding us that he overcame the enemy and that the enemy cannot touch us and win if we have Jesus. Amen. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18.
I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Righteous Living, Ruby number for verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. I got two. I got two uh, nuggets for for this. Number one is righteous living will defy the laws of physics and gravity. Amen. That's good. That's good. To magnify and glorify the power and character of God. Say that again. Righteous living defies, will defy the laws of physics and gravity to magnify and glorify the power and character of God. And because God is a glutton for his own glory, he will do it. Flesh will not glory in any of it. He will use you and nature to demonstrate his power and authority. Amen? Amen. Psalms 47, verse 3 and 4. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob, whom he loves. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? Verse 7. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? Verse 8, And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying. The next uh, Righteous Living Ruby with the same verse is, Living righteously before God will have him Perform miraculous feats, feats, F-E-A-T-S, in front of you to your enemies. Righteous living before God, he will perform miraculous feats in front of you to your enemies. Am I the only one that has enemies? <laughs> Raise your hand if you got enemies. Amen. Yes, everybody else don't have enemies. You, you must be really walking holy before God, huh? <laughs> You're doing something really, really good not to have any enemies. Wow. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 5 and 8. Try 5 through 8. Thus says God, God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it and gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring our prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory. I will not give it to another, nor my praise to carved images. He will use you and the natural elements and defy all that, not only to prove to you, but to prove to your enemies that he is God. Amen. Yes. Amen. He is God. He wants, 
He is and he will continue to be. That's right. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's right. God moves through us and wants to use us and tap out everything we feel, every gift, every talent, every ability for his glory. Amen. But it is predicated first and foremost on you and your commitment to him. Hallelujah. Where are you in your faith level with him? Your obedience level to him. If he says leave everything to you today, leave the house, the money, the car, the children, the grandchildren, leave America and go. We you go. Where is your faith then? Mm -hmm. How is your faith then? Where is my obedience level then? Every one of these individuals paid a hefty price out of their obedience and love for God. Their innermost desire, which should be ours today, is to do what God said. Yeah. And do it to the best of our ability. Even if it challenges everything that this world system said. Are you willing to stand up to the world system and say, no, I will not marry same-sex individual. That's right. Amen. I'd rather go to jail. Are you willing? Amen. Are you willing? Is Amen. your faith and your obedience yes, at that Lord. level one Amen. that you can come face to face and say no, knowing that they can take you to jail, yeah. knowing that you can lose your life, maybe. Yeah. The Lord has me studying the book of Judges. I've read through the whole book. Now he wants me to come back and study it chapter by chapter. And he said, I want you to study and know my way. There's a pattern to my behavior and my character. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. And the consistent thing in the book of Judges, uh, Bonnie, that I saw, the people did what they thought was, was right oh. in their eyes. What they thought was right in their eyes. But they came, they were taught, they stood on the foundation of the law. Mm -hmm. They knew them. Yeah. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt mm -hmm. not. Do not. Mm -hmm. And yet, they are disobeyed. He said, go in and conquer the land. Mm -hmm. What did they do? Conquered part. Yeah. They allowed the inhabitants of Canaan to continue to abide side by side with them. Mm -hmm. they did. And he told them, because you did not obey me, mm -hmm. you did not do what I asked you to do, I will give you to your enemies. Mm -hmm. They will be a thorn to your side. Amen. And did not God honor his word? They got dragged in the dirt. <laughs> yeah. Because they did what they thought was right in their eyes. Yet they knew the truth. And the truth was what God said. Mm -hmm. Do we know what is right? Not in our eyes, but in God's eyes. That's the blueprint. That's the blueprint, and it should be the blueprint to how we live our life That's right. today. That's right. We do what is right in the eyes of God, not what we think is right. Yes. See? Partial obedience is still disobedience. Amen. When the prophet who came from India, we have the privilege of of listening to this powerful man of God minister. Powerful. 
When I say powerful, I mean powerful to the point he'll be sitting in his room and Jesus will walk through the walls or the angels will come and stand to the side right. and speak to him and say, he's waiting for you out in the balcony. That kind of power. Wow. And he said, I quote him, Sadhu, when, they get the, when, the, when the time comes for the mark of the beast, Will you take, will you take the mark? Oh, we quit to say, heck no, I ain't taking the mark. Okay. He said, but people act differently when they're under tremendous that, pressure. That's right, right. man. Which I'm is true. You. Amen. Then he said, don't be like, and tell the Lord, I'll take the mug, but Lord, I really don't want to take the mug, but you see my heart. I'm just mm -hmm. taking it because I don't want to die, because I can't buy or sell food without the mark on me. But Lord, really, you know my heart says I'm for you. Mm -hmm. That is an example of what doing what you think is right. Yeah, that's a good example, too. It's wrong. Hey, Amen. We cannot be lukewarm. It's either you in hot water or you in cold water. No warm water in between. Time out for the body of believers to do what they think is right. Because see, you know, when I do what I think is right, uh, uh, Barney, I'm placating myself to appease my standing in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm securing one foot here mm -hmm. that I still have some kind of substance and attachment to the world versus cutting myself off completely and attaching myself to Calvary. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. It's either the world system or God's system. Mm -hmm. No in the middle. What? New Jerusalem. Amen. There's no in between. Amen. Righteously. Not doing what we think is right, but what he says is right. And be aware that you will pay a price. Even unto death. As the song says, my Shekinah glory, will you still say yes? Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. Will you? Amen. When they come to put the mark of the beast on you, will you still say yes to the master? Or will you say yes to the God of this world? Will you say yes to support? We we hate the sin, but we love the sin. And we pray that they would come into the saving knowledge of who Christ is. Mm -hmm. And would turn from that sinful lifestyle and come in. Mm -hmm. But even if you get confronted by with the same sex and they say, we want you to marry us. Yep. What will you do? Will you do what Bonnie thinks is right in her eyes? Will you do Carlton what you think is right in Carlton McLeod's eyes? What about you, Chastity? Or you will do what is right oh. in God's eyes. Amen. Amen. Abraham left his people. Sarah left and questioned the promise of the heir. Mm -hmm. Enoch was so hot, God snatched him up. Yes. Amen. Amen. Moses gave up that life of comfort and right standing in the eyes of the world to go forth and be a deliverer for a nation. Everyone denied themselves. Amen. Picked up their cross. And said, I'll follow you. Yeah, that's good. We thank you for the opportunity to 
to be able to learn from you more. Know. But through the great examples of those that have paved the way before us, yeah. their faith and obedience to you, even in their flaws, they trusted you. And they did what you wanted. They obeyed you to the very end. Let that be our prayer. To the very end, we will obey and do what is right in your eyes. Strengthen us now. But we keep our eyes on you, Jesus. But one day soon, we too will sit in the new Jerusalem. We too will see thee. Bless us now in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm just going to pass this around. And uh, Dominique, you just play some worship. Or if you wanted to come up. The last time, when we did this, the last class session, and this is what I challenged everyone that was here. When you come up, you take as many stones as you want. But I want to challenge you that the stones that you take, every time you look at them, let them remind you of living righteously before God. And I asked, I said, don't take these and throw it on the floor. And just chuck it off to the side. Put this in a place that will remind you that every time you see them, this reminds you to live righteously before the Lord. Amen. And that you associate these red stones with rubies, Righteous living rubies. And, it, and you associate with this and it takes you, reminds you always, righteous living rubies, Hebrews 11. That the Holy Spirit will always bring to your remembrance the examples of the word that we pray and encourage you when you feel like you can't do it anymore. When you feel like you're being challenged to come out of your comfort zone. When you feel like you're still waiting on a promise that God owes you from 2,000 years ago, you're still waiting. When you feel like you've been challenged in your 